Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways, 12 Days of Christmas Guests. We're talking to a famous face about their personal relationship with the Second World War. And this doesn't get any more personal. As our final episode of the year, we thought you'd treat you to a brilliant guest, Susan Eisenhower, the granddaughter of Dwight D. Eisenhower, like himself. <laughs> Achtung, achtung, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray and James Holland uh, with slightly seasonally uh, cracked voices and splutters and coughs. And Jim, who are we talking to today? This is very exciting. Well, it is really exciting. It's a very, very honoured guest today. Um, she's president of the Eisenhower Group, which is a sort of strategic consultancy, an author in her own right. Um, she's just written, uh, released in paperback over in the US, um, and you can get absolutely get it in the UK as well, How Ike Led, The Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. It's Susan Eisenhower, and Susan is, of course, the granddaughter of the one and only Dwight D. Eisenhower. And what a, what a special treat to have you on. Well, thank you so much, James. This is a real honour. Oh, well, I mean, uh, I think the honour is all ours, isn't it? Let's face that's, it. that's exactly what I was going to James, say. James, yeah. your, your book on uh, D-Day and, and your work in this area is legendary. And uh, I follow many of your activities, including the history festivals and everything else that you're involved in. And it's it's just great. Ah, oh, well, you're, you're, you're too kind. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, we've met, uh, met each other uh, uh, several times along the way. And I think the last time was probably was, was, was 20, uh, was it 2019? Um, uh, when we were doing this, the 75th of D Day, wasn't it? I think we were in that, that wonderful chateau. That was quite, quite chateau. an event, quite a, uh, I should say a series of events. It was really a, a remarkable thing. And I, I'm sure that you agree that it will always remain special in people's memories because that's the last time you're ever going to see that many veterans in one place on that coast. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it was amazing seeing those guys because, you know, obviously by the time you're getting into your late nineties, lots of them can be very, um, pretty craggy by that by that stage. But what was amazing about that was there they were with their baseball caps with kind of sort of World War II veteran written on it. And, you know, several of them looked pretty, pretty good nick, didn't they? I mean, you know, they were kind of live and bonny and sort of sprinting up into the tent and, you know, that tent that we had outside in the grounds. I mean, it was really quite something. It really was. And the nice thing about that particular event where uh, you spoke and I spoke as well is that they had both British and American vets there together. And uh, this yeah. sometimes makes me sad that the Brits go to the British beaches and the Americans go to the American beaches. But I think uh, the more we can uh, talk about this story as a allied joint venture, um, I think the more powerful the story itself becomes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. And, and in, in, in saying that, you are absolutely echoing your grandfather's words, aren't you? Because if there was one man above all who worked so tirelessly to keep that extraordinary coalition together, it was him. I mean, he, he, he was just superb in understanding how you're better together rather than apart. Well, and, and uh, vitally better together because um, certainly no one could have done it without the other. So um, this interdependence... Uh, in this war is really very striking. And I hope everyone remembers that where they go to honor their own um, national effort here. But it really was an integrated international effort that um, produced the desired results. Well, I'm keen to talk about how Ike led in a minute. But but first of all, I mean, I mean what was it? I mean, you must remember him. I mean, what was it? What was he like? I mean, was he was he a doting grandfather? Was he kindly? I'm I'm sort of imagining he was both those things. But I mean, what was it like being the granddaughter of Eisenhower? Well, I don't know. I mean, I haven't tried it any other way. Uh, we only get we, we only get one shot at this. So, but um, I must say, my parents did I think a magnificent job of teaching us to keep our personal relationship with him separate from his own career, uh, understanding yeah. that he and his decisions would be the subject of debate well into our later years and uh, not to take it personally. And so I don't take it personally. Um, but I, I can say that if anybody wants to question him as a grandfather, we could have a, a real fight about it because um, <laughs> he, he was so... Good to his grandchildren. I mean, 
he spent so much time. He, he, um, I rode his horses and he would come to, um, some of the horse shows I was in. Uh, he went to my sister's ballet recitals and my brother's swimming meets. And I don't know how he found time for it, but you know, he didn't do it, uh, every time, but he did it enough so that we remember it really very well. Uh, I got lots of encouraging letters um, over the years from him. And, of course, after the White House, we lived on a property adjacent to his. So I probably saw him three or four times a week. Wow. So you were, up, you were up at Gettysburg, were you? Uh, yes. Um, my father was helping uh, Granddad write his White House memoirs. My, my father went on to be a military historian. Um, as I think you know, he wrote a book on the Battle of the Bulge and uh, many other uh, books related to World War II, the First War, and the, many other topics. Um, so we were living right on um, a, a property adjacent to the Eisenhower Farm, which is how it uh, how it was possible for me to just trot down the lane to uh, ride one of Granddad's uh, overfed horses, if I may say so. Uh, a real handful <laughs> that lot, but uh, I got lots of encouragement from him. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that people... Uh, uh, our listeners will be familiar with. It's the letter that he wrote, and, and there are photographs of it, of his of his handwriting, in case the Overlord invasion had failed, in which he says, it's mine alone. If any blame should be attributed to this, it's mine it's alone. It's astonishing, isn't it? It's the, most, it's the most incredible document to look at because there's crossings out and there's corrections and all that sort of stuff. But at the core of it is this man saying, putting his hand up, and thank God he never had to resort to this, but that this is his position is absolutely fascinating. And given given that, you know, in some of the historiography, there is the idea that everyone's fighting like rats in a sack in the, uh, you know, in uh, in the Allied High Command, everyone's disagreeing and all this sort of stuff. For Eisenhower to say, I'm responsible for this. And quite the clearly, with me. the black sauce with me is, I, I mean, I'm always, I'm always struck and moved by this to read. Do you think that's essentially the core of his command style and his decision-making style? Oh, I, I do. I, I think uh, it's absolutely fundamental to how he viewed his role during the war. Uh, in addition to How Ike Led, I wrote uh, 25 years before that a book called Mrs. Ike. And this was a biography of my uh, grandparents, uh, actually uh, through the lens of my grandmother. And it's extra extraordinary how often... General Eisenhower, Ike to Mamie, yeah. would write her letters uh, expressing his philosophy about what his role was during the war. And his philosophy was he had a job to do and a duty. And that um, and he says in one point in these letters, uh, this war is so big and, and, and vast, it is not hard to understand that self-sacrifice uh, is central to our mission here. Um, and, and so I think this was absolutely, uh, this note, as you say, as core. Now, as a, as a analyst or a professional, um, who does a lot of leadership training, the thing that's striking to me about that note, uh, is that he was even taking responsibility for the weather forecast. Uh, yikes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, you know, that's such a big part of this story. And then you add to that the very difficult decision on whether or not to use the paratroopers. Uh, as part of this operation, uh, going into this momentous day. And, you know, it's extraordinary that, of course, if you're going to drop paratroopers, you better have the right kind of weather. So this becomes really a very uh, complex and uh, a decision that, you know, um, had some very uh, complex and worrisome uh, elements. Uh, so I, I admired that about him, but he also confessed that he carried one of those um, in case of failure notes with him for every major invasion. And I think he did it uh, not only to have something in writing to release in case of failure, but also to remind himself um, that uh, this was his decision and he would uh, live with the outcome of it. And, and again, back to Mrs. Ike, there are some letters in there um, that are just extraordinary about if I fail... Uh, I hope that it will be seen that I did my duty to the best of my ability and that I will come back to you with um, respect and admiration. You know, actually, <laughs> I uh, was reading Mrs. Ike the other day and thinking, wow, I'm really glad I found those letters. Um, a lot of the letters in that book I used just before they went to the Eisenhower Library. <laughs> 
So that itself was a bit of a groundbreaker. But who who would have thought that a foreign policy expert would end up writing the the bookends to the Eisenhowers, Mrs. Ike and how Ike led? (laughs) (laughs) Pretty crazy because it isn't my area of uh, expertise normally. Well, yes, but you're you're a strategist, aren't you? So you're and and your grandfather was a strategist, and and you know that was his his level was at that very high strategic level. So I guess you've got you must have an affinity for those decisions that he's making. Yeah, well, I I find them fascinating, and I had a lot of fun with how I led because I what I tried to do uh, in this book is to demonstrate that Eisenhower the general and Eisenhower the president was the same person. And I like to use some of the military analogies, uh, like, for instance, the chapter on civil rights I called establishing a beachhead. That's the way he looked at it. And and this helps the civilian community because they don't understand what his strategy was for civil rights. But to uh, say it in one sentence, he managed to desegregate everything the federal government controlled on civil rights uh, before he left office. Uh, virtually all the uh, the critical issues. Um, so that's establishing a beachhead so that those gains can't be rolled back. And, you know, uh, people would say he didn't go far enough, but he didn't have time to go any farther than what he did. But there was a strategy, almost a military strategy behind it. In other words, uh, what real estate do I control? Um, where are my opponents or slash enemies? Uh, how are they thinking about this issue? All those things that uh, work in making consequential decisions in warfare, actually <laughs> work in politics as well. And presumably how, how I bring other people in on this, how I, how I bring people together, how I bring people over to my way of thinking. I mean, it's... it's um... Well, I'm, and, the, and the limits of my resources and what my allies are prepared to do to help me too, which is the real key to po- politics after all, is, you, you know, your greatest enemies are often in your own party, aren't they? Because you're, you're competing for the, the same uh, space. Uh, yourselves, aren't you? It's the thing. Well, that's a that's an excellent point. And then I would say one thing. It was a little bit of a buried line in how I cled. But if I'm often asked, what do, do I think um, was one of the key elements that um, attributed to his success? And I'd say I think he was a genius at knowing when to depl- deploy his ego and when to suppress it. Yeah, that's interesting. Keeping this fractious uh, alliance together required letting others win a few, you know, understanding other people's viewpoints, uh, being able to manage that in terms of your own uh, views and ego. And, uh, you know, it's a it's a complex thing. But I think that itself is worthy of a study. And there have been many great uh, pieces on that. What What do you think gave him the personal resources to be so skilled at this? What, is, is it a product of his his family, his upbringing, his family's view, his his time at West Point, the, 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 you know, his contemporaries at West Point. He's after he's in that extraordinary class at West Point. I mean, what's going into the mix to make him so well suited for this for the role he finds himself in? Well, you know, he's a bit of a troublemaker at West Point, but even they recognized by uh, the end of his tenure that he had uh, real leadership qualities. I, I'm going to date it back, um, and most things start in your childhood, but uh, there was a secret sauce in that family. Every Eisenhower son, all six surviving of them, went off to do really quite remarkable things. And uh, I think part of it was his his mother was deeply empathetic. She was She taught cooperation. Uh, she taught serving something larger than yourself. Uh, she was uh, very religious, very idealistic. Uh, so he had that embedded in his nature. And his father was a real disciplinarian. And uh, having been uh, whooped probably a couple of times for, you know, being out of line at home, they used to do that in those days. Um, you know, he really became very good at self-discipline, which is also yeah. critical for leadership. Um, and then I think uh, West Point reinforced all this and then working for some very difficult bosses. It all, our experience all comes together in some magical way for better, or for worse as we get older. And um, I think he would probably uh, attribute his good start to a good family. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because at a time where the where the U.S. Army was quite small and, and and opportunities were quite limited, actually, he although he got stuck at major for quite a long time, 
He actually had quite an interesting time, didn't he? Because he was, he, I mean, one of the things he did, which I always thought was remarkable, was I think it was the late 1920s. He he basically wrote the study of the uh, American experience in the First World War. So he went and covered the battlegrounds of Europe and wrote a book about it. It's published as, as the War Department, isn't it? But So, so it's anonymous, but it, it is his pen. So the interesting thing is when he comes to kind of be, be Supreme Allied Commander in 1944-45 in, in, in the ETO... He knows half these places because he's been there in the 1920s and walked that ground. And, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. And then later on in the 1930s, he's, he's over in the Philippines, isn't he, serving under MacArthur. Uh, and, and whatever you say about MacArthur, what, what, a, what a fantastic opportunity that must have been to see someone who's such a high-powered, um, who's been, you know, chief of staff of the U.S. Army before he goes to back, back to the Philippines. What, what, a, what an amazing eye on the, on the world to see that someone at such a high command operating at, at that level and that closely. And le- lessons in political subtlety p- to be learned at, at, at M- MacArthur's and Knee, I suppose. You can see yeah. you can see a style you maybe don't want to emulate or don't seek to emulate mm. because, you know, MacArthur is such a dominant personality and that, that has its limitations, obviously. Well, it's interesting. Um, you know this better than I do, but uh, there's uh, often been a lot of criticism that he didn't have combat experience. Um, I, I dare say that the strategic leader of the operation needs to have other skills that maybe people who did have combat experience didn't have. But I often say to people, if you think you're in a dead end job, uh, you're not um, alert enough because uh, certainly Ike's contemporaries thought that he had two dead end jobs. One was to be the first tank commander at Camp Colton, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania during the First World War. He was commanding 10,000 people, including uh, in the middle of the Spanish flu influenza in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, received a Distinguished Service Medal at the age of 28 for that performance. Uh, But he was also, with George Patton, one of the great advocates for tanks early on, very early on. And so what did you need during World War II? Uh, You needed um, the capacity to... Um, command sizable numbers of troops uh, to be resilient, uh, creative, which he was at Camp Colt. And then he walks the American battlefields of France. He, he, he knew both tanks and terrain, uh, which was a big part of it. And then he spent a lot of time uh, in Washington, D.C. at the War Department and logistics and the rest of it. So he, he had played roles in all of those key areas that were of importance uh, when the the big one came around, the big war. I mean, there are plenty of also the other. I always think that points a little redundantly because plenty of people didn't have combat experience either. The U.S. Army at the time, in the state it's in, and its sort of expansion in uh, from 1939 onwards, you, you're going to you're going to have people who don't have combat experience. It's, it's sort of it's not that it's irrelevant, but it's just the the way the dice are going to roll. You are going to end up with people in big positions who don't have. Well, that. I believe that. Um, um, <laughs> Omar Bradley didn't have combat experience no. either. No, he didn't. Um, no. And and I think your point is extremely well taken when you think of what scaling up. I mean, we talk about scaling up today. I don't think there's ever been an effort uh, at scaling up in such a short time, certainly in no. modern history. No, it's unprecedented. And institutionally, what that does to the American army, the people that did that, which is people like Bradley and Eisenhower and, and, and you know, um, those people involved in that, that's the. That's why they're in the positions they're in because they've been involved intimately with this recreate. I mean, they re- basically remake the U.S. Army in the process as well. They you know, completely redesign officer selection, all that sort of stuff, but bust up the old way of doing things with colonels raising regiments and all that sort of thing because it's not. It's not going to work. I always think, who cares if he's got combat experience or not? Because after all, he's so effective. What does it matter? Well, the other thing I think is so interesting about him is is, is about Ike is is just that incredibly steep learning curve from the moment he arrives in um, in Britain. In well, he he does that 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 reconnaissance mission. He's sent over by Marshall to go and sort of check out how things are going with the build up of of American troops. Blero in I think it's, it's maybe it's April or May nineteen forty forty two. Reports back, then gets the gets the job to command American forces in the European theatre in Britain with Clark as his deputy. And he gets out there in, I think, mid-June, something like that, 19, 1942. And he's out there to do Sledgehammer, which is, of course, is a cross-channel invasion. Then it becomes Torch. Then he becomes Supreme Allied Commander of, uh, in the Mediterranean for Tunisia and Sicily and southern Italy. Then he comes back to do D-Day and Overlord. 
the learning curve is just immense. And, and all that time, there is this sort of... I mean, one of the wonderful things about the Butcher Diary, and for, and for those who don't know this, Harry Butcher is this guy who, who was a radio broadcaster and PR guy who the Eisenhowers got to know in the interwar years. And, and when he got this posting to Britain, he thought it would be good to have someone who could sort of, you know, he could bounce off and who, who wouldn't be subservient to him and would tell him as it was and, and just sort of, you know, a pal around that he could sort of converse with. So he, he, he managed to get Butcher a kind of, you know, a sort of slightly phony um, rank as lieutenant commander in the Navy. And he goes over as his naval aide, slightly in inverted commas. And, and, he, and Ike asks Butcher to keep a diary. And he then published this in my three years of Eisenhower. But actually, one can go to Abilene and the Presidential Library and see the original diaries. And they're a little bit fruitier than the, the, the finished published thing. Well, not by much. It's pretty much the same. But you get this wonderful window into the evolution of Ike as the Supreme Allied Commander. And you see him kind of being summoned by Churchill in the summer. You know, it's like August 1942. And suddenly Churchill rings up at 11 o'clock at night, just as they're getting sort of him and, and Wayne Clark are getting kind of supper on their laps at their little cottage. You know, and it's just, it's an amazing insight to his character. And he just comes across so incredibly well and likable and decent and, and, and with, with immense moral courage. Uh, and again, this profound sense of beauty, it, it, all of it comes across in, in, incredibly clearly, I think. It's its such a fabulous tool, isn't it, for the student of Eisenhower? Well, uh, there's another book if you want to have a, a wonderful laugh. Um, it's called General Ike and Sergeant Mickey. And this is written by Mickey McKeo, his uh, valet and houseman. And it's a riot because uh, we learn all kinds of things. We learn that Eisenhower sings in the, sh uh, the shower, that when he stayed overnight with uh, Winston Churchill, he had to wear Churchill's pajamas, which didn't fit, which then throttled him in the middle of the night. And Mickey was worried that uh, someone had attacked the general because he was clearly expressing discomfort. It's the pajamas were too big. I mean, we also learn that uh, when the German uh, uh, were when the Germans were bombing um, near his headquarters, he refused to go to the bomb shelter because he'd be damned if the Germans were going to wreck his dinner. You know, I yes. mean, the detail yeah, yeah, yeah. is absolutely marvelous. And uh, just because um, Mickey McKeo doesn't know what on earth is going on in the war, he's just watching how Eisenhower's reacting on a day to day basis. That's amazing. Wow. I'd never heard about that. I, must, I have to say. Oh, it's it's marvelous, and somebody has gotten it back into print for. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, all. Sorry, of Susan. How do you spell sar the sergeant's name? A uh, Mckeo, M C K E O G H. Huh. So it's General Ike and Sergeant Mckeo. Uh, uh, and and Sergeant Mickey, I think it's Sergeant Mickey. Yes, and uh, it's it's a riot. Um, it really is, and we we uh, because Mickey is getting him dressed uh, in the morning and taking care of his uniforms at night. You know, we know all kinds of things about how he responded um, on the morning of June 6th. We know all sorts of things about his reaction to um, liberating Ordruf, which was a subcamp of Buchenwald, um, and yep. his response. Mickey could not believe he'd never seen Eisenhower's face look like that. Um, and this is how he <laughs> describes Ike coming back from seeing um, for Eisenhower, the first real evidence of the depravity of this Holocaust. Yeah. And it's an invaluable book, I think, for sheer color. And um, uh, we also find out that uh, Ike thinks that what the troops get fed is intimately involved in morale. And when he used to go on these trips to visit troops, he always went to the kitchen. He tested the pots and pans. He looked in the refrigerator. And if the troops weren't being fed properly, he was on it. Now, this makes me smile because Ike was one of seven boys. Six survived and his mother had uh, no help. So the boys had to rotate through chores. So Ike knew kitchens well. He was the family cook. Uh -huh. uh, he could sew on his own buttons. And, and once uh, during the Normandy uh, breakout, uh, he was located at a headquarters and two cows were delivered to him uh, by some Frenchmen uh, who wanted to make sure that the general had um, fresh milk. And nobody on his household staff, this is the Supreme Allied Commander, had to show them how to milk a cow. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. 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 So a lot of this detail is in Mickey's book. And uh, and also, as you say, Harry Butcher's written a very colorful, 
uh, informative account that really lets you see how a person grows into um, operations that are increasingly complex and and consequential. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh at the end, at the end of the war, when he does, when when he has visited the camps, he makes that very strong point, Eisenhower, doesn't he? Like he says, we need people need to witness this because I'm worried that this could turn into, I mean, and to use some modern parlance, sort of fake news thing, and that that what that what he was particularly worried about was this needed evidencing because otherwise it'll sound too fantastic and the world won't believe it. That's a statement of extraordinary insight and and prescience, isn't it? Well, that's right. He um, he had this uh, long range view. If you read his presidential speeches, for instance, uh, grandchildren are always mentioned. Now, I'd like to flatter myself and think he had um, me and my siblings in mind when he said this. Of course he did. But he meant it metaphorically that this is about the future. Right. So but uh, when he was uh, in charge of um, the army of occupation um, between uh, the unconditional surrender in November, of 1945, he says to his staff, if Germany is a prosperous democratic nation 50 years from now, we will know that we were successful. So he's always thinking in this, uh, these long-term categories. Now, if I could just go back to the Holocaust for a minute, of course, he ordered American troops who are anywhere near any of these so-called horror camps to go in and to chronicle this. So my father, by this point, um, was uh, with a unit in the European theater, and he was ordered to go to Buchenwald. And my father took maybe 30 or 40 absolutely extraordinary pictures of the Holocaust with his camera, um, and he kept those photos. And I have to tell you that my generation and even uh, my own grandchildren uh, got the whole Buchenwald lecture with pictures as Gosh. we were growing up. So this was something that he took very, very seriously indeed, to yeah. the extent that even um, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren were um, told a great deal about this with pictures to show for it. Yeah. Gosh, how fascinating. Yeah, isn't it? Really is. Now, Susan, on a, on a slightly lighter note, we're at, uh, you know, this is Christmas time and, and this is one of our Christmas specials. And just before we, we, we started recording, you were saying that, that, that Christmas was always very special to Ike. Well, it's, um, yeah, so, um, I would say Christmas was bittersweet. So, um, on the, uh, let's start with the sad part, uh, first, because I think, okay. um, that's consistent with the, 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 the last topic we just discussed. But, um, Ike and Mamie had two sons and, and the first son, uh, Dowd Dwight uh, died at the age of three. Uh, he contracted scarlet fever, and it's rather ironic that he managed to get through the Spanish flu influenza when his father was managing that crisis in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, but died a couple of years later of scarlet fever. This happens over Christmas time. He goes into the infirmary with a, a, a set of symptoms on um, Christmas Eve, uh, the 23rd going into the 24th, uh, the Christmas tree was already up. Uh, they took him to the Army Post, and he uh, died on January 2nd. Um, since he was in quarantine, Granddad actually uh, violated quarantine and held this little boy in his arms uh, as he died. Uh, my grandmother had pneumonia, and she could not go to the hospital. She was not allowed in. Uh, and so this is always a sadness. And if you read his letters to Mamie during the war, he often comments on this young boy. You know, we might have been grandparents by now and that that kind of thing, the sadness. And by the way, if I may add to this, um, I think it's one reason he he felt that every death is a is a tragedy because he knew what that felt like. So that's the sad part of Christmas. But then think about it. All of all of his promotions came through at Christmas time. And just before Christmas, he finds out that he is going to be uh, doing the, the, the D-Day um, crossing. And so uh, many of his stars arrive just when I say just before Christmas, you know, obviously in the general Christmas period. Uh, he decides to run for president uh, not long after uh, Christmas in 1952. And so, you know, it's it's it was a period of um, monumental events. Now, having said that, uh, my grandmother, in order to manage the complexity of Christmas, made such a big deal over Christmas. I don't think any of her uh, 
immediate relatives have recovered. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm serious. This used to start in October. Everybody got a gift. The Secret Service men, the Secret Service men's children, the Secret Service men's grandchildren. Uh, same for the, for the people who worked in the house. And when they were in the White House, everybody in the White House got a Christmas present wrapped by wow. Mamie Eisenhower. It went on. And then the whole thing was just overwhelming. And my own theory is that that's what she did to manage the emotion that was so yeah. much stronger for this couple because of all of these events. And they all just sort of revolve around this period. Mm. Yeah, I get that. And then yeah. remember, yeah. Um, after Christmas, and Eisenhower gets the uh, command for D-Day, he comes back uh, for a secret visit. Um, and that's the first time they had seen each other since uh, my grandparents had seen each other since he went off in 1942. You know, it's a very emotion-laden period, not just for the Eisenhowers, but for everybody else, too. <laughs> but can you remember, as a child, can you remember going going over to the farm and, and having Christmas there? Absolutely. She had she had uh, spode china with Christmas trees on them. I mean, everything was over the top, James. I've just got to tell you, everything was over the top. And so uh, we don't really, as a family, oh, uh, when Nikita Khrushchev came to the farm in 1959, in the middle of the Berlin ultimatum, he brought Christmas tree bulbs um, because in, in the Soviet Union at that time, they were um, celebrating New Year's with Christmas tree bulbs. So he gave right. uh, he gave my grandparents a huge number of Christmas tree bulbs, which ironically were on our Christmas tree every year. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't know. This is um, is a pretty... Um, crazy season, but we, we all go into it. You know, we could never put on a set of events like my grandmother did. So we, we too will always feel, um, both, um, uh, happy and a little tinge of sadness at Christmas. Oh, well, well, Susan, it's been great to talk to you and lovely to see you again. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's just really interesting. A real pleasure. And, um, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, thank, thank you, you so much for this opportunity. And uh, How Ike Led is in paperback and on Kindle. Since you mentioned it, I've bought my copy, as is Sergeant Mickey and General Ike. And uh, I should also say that uh, How Ike Led is also uh, in hardcover too. Uh, I'm just There we go. So in all uh, contemporary formats available for your <laughs> By the way, uh, Mrs. Enjoyment. Mrs. Ike is still um, is still in print too. So there we are. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. So you can you can get your fill. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, we've been talking to Susan Eisenhower. Have a very merry Christmas. Bye-bye. Cheerio. 